Welcome to this special event to launch Creation Care, a new online tool to encourage households to care for God's world. It's so good to see so many people here on Zoom, but we're also delighted that people are joining us on Facebook Live too. So welcome to you all on whatever platform uh, you are joining us on. Now, my name is Hannah Mayo and I'm the Eco Church lead for Holy Trinity Church in Westcott, which is just outside Dorking. And I'm so glad to be hosting this webinar. Firstly, because I'm actually very, very excited about this scheme and the clear framework that it offers to enable further engagement in and real commitment to living more sustainably in our families and households. And I can't wait to launch it in our church in January. But I'm also excited because I know how much work has gone into the scheme's creation by Annabelle South, who's the Eco Church lead for St Paul's in Dorking. And she's also a friend and a local Eco Church collaborator. And I'm so delighted for her that she's got to the point of being able to launch Creation Care officially this evening. Now, in a little while, um, Annabelle will talk us through and demonstrate how it all works. But before we start, let me introduce our speakers for this evening and tell you a little bit more about how the evening's going to work. In a moment, we're going to hear from the Right Reverend Ruth Bushyega. Give us a wave, Ruth. Hello, Bishop Ruth. Good evening, everybody. Now Bishop of Horsham, but until earlier this year, she was Vicar of St Paul's in Dorking and helped Annabelle come up with the scheme and took part in the pilot herself. And she'll ground us in the theology, why we as Christians should care for God's creation. The Reverend Dr. Dave Bookless, give us a wave, Dave. Ra, there he is, uh, is Director of Theology at Arosha International, the global Christian organization engaging communities across the world in nature conservation. And I'll talk to him about the difference that our personal actions can make in building a sustainable world. And Helen Stevens is also here. Helen, give us a wave. Where's Helen? There she is, excellent. And Helen is Church Relations Manager at Arosha UK and leads the Eco Church team. So I'm looking forward to hearing how she sees Creation Care and Eco Church working hand in hand. And later on, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A if the evening goes to plan. So if you think of any questions you'd like to ask, here's how you do it. We're using a website called Slido for this rather than the Zoom chat that you might be more used to. Um, doing it this way means that anyone watching on Facebook Live can also uh, post questions. So that's what we wanted to do. And it means that not only can you see what questions other people are asking, but you can vote for the ones that you're especially interested in hearing the answers to. Annabelle, are you going to put up um, a slide so we can see the Slido web details? Hopefully that's gonna pop up in a moment. Um, so do log into that if you can, uh, and then you can post your questions, see what other people are asking and vote for the questions that you really, really want to hear the answers to. So that'll just help us uh, prioritize those questions. And just one other thing, uh, says it here, please, could you keep yourself muted during the meeting? So let's begin by hearing from the Right Reverend Ruth Bushyager, the Bishop of Horsham. Before ordained ministry, she worked as an internal policy advisor in the cabinet office, focusing on issues of climate change and working with the United Nations. And she is passionate about seeing Christians in local churches actively engaging in environmental stewardship and working for a more sustainable planet as a core element of what it means to follow Christ. So look out for a flood of parishes in the Chichester Diocese signing up for Eco Church. I think that's all about to happen. Good evening, Bishop Ruth. Good evening, hello, it's just great to be with you and I've only got a few minutes so I'm gonna launch myself right in to what I want to say. Um, I've been asked to speak about why as Christians we should care for the environment and I've got six core reasons and about a minute on each of my core reasons and these reasons are ex explicitly Christian reasons for creation care and that's really important emphasis. If you think about it there are very few reasons strictly speaking 
why someone without religious faith should be passionate about environmental protection. The only real one is for the reason of self-interest. A polluted planet and climate catastrophe does not serve my interests because I want to drink clean water, breathe well, eat well and live well. That's a compelling argument. But all other reasons, including the beauty of the national world and any moral imperatives for creation care, come ultimately from a worldview of faith. Faith that gives an account of beauty and a basis for morality. So let's dive in. Why, as a Christian, should I be actively engaged in creation care? Number one, because scripture instructs us that we humans are charged by God to be stewards of the earth. We've been given responsibility for caring for something that doesn't belong to us. And one day we will give an account for that stewardship. We read this in the early chapters of Genesis. The God we worship is the God who created the whole cosmos and it all belongs to him. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, says the psalmist. And he commissions us to rule over creation in a way that sustains, protects and enhance his work so that all creation will fulfill the, the purposes that God intends for it. Number two, scripture is clear that the creation reveals the creator. Just as when my daughter does a painting or when I bake a cake, there's been an act of creation and we understand that the cosmos is made as part of the self-revelation of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So unsurprisingly, we do not just find that the earth is useful to us, that it meets our needs for warmth and food and light and drink, Creation is also stunningly beautiful, from the rainforests to the frozen Arctic, from the Himalayas to the deep sea, there is a majesty and a beauty about all human and non-human life and about every natural landscape. And it leaves us in awe for a reason. God reveals his power and beauty through creation to bring us to his praise. The world exists for the glory of God, and because we were made for God's glory, we must protect what glorifies him. Thirdly, creation care is also about our story of redemption and our understanding of the work of Christ. We know that we've been charged with stewardship over the earth, but our sin has meant that we've turned away from this responsibility. We have utterly failed through our own pride and selfishness. The evidence for that is absolutely everywhere and it's comprehensively catastrophic. Our fall in the Garden of Eden, the consequence of our sin, is brokenness and that brokenness works three ways. Brokenness between the, human, the, the people and God and brokenness between the people and the other people, their horizontal relationships. And also Genesis is clear, a brokenness between the people and their relationship with the earth. And yet our story is not that God walked away, but the opposite. God comes to our rescue in Christ and dying on the cross. He doesn't just fix the relationship between people and God. His redemption is holistic. He fixes the brokenness between people and other people and between people and the earth. So to live out our salvation in the power of the spirit in new relationship with God and each other and the earth. It's a holistic redemption. The Bible tells us Jesus died to reconcile all things to himself and that his work is to make everything new. Number four, creation care is about basic obedience to the commands of scripture from the lips of Jesus. The greatest commands are to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbour as yourself. Who is our neighbour? Again, the Bible is clear. Our neighbour is far more than the person like me or the person living next door. Our neighbour is the person not like me and who is not next door. My neighbour lives in the Maldives 
and his village has had to be abandoned because of rising sea level. My neighbour is in Bangladesh and she has lost all her family to flooding. My neighbour is in California and he cannot breathe because of the wildfires. My neighbour is the unborn child of the future who will read about what this generation did to the planet and will be utterly confounded as to how we destroyed our only home. And what is love if I'm to love my neighbour? Jesus shows us love. It is not a feeling or a romance. It is active and it is sacrificial. Love is sacrifice. So to love my neighbour, I sacrifice my comfort and my convenience to change my life, to heal the earth we share. Number five, creation care is a justice issue. I am rich and I am comfortable and I am protected in this specific part of the Northern Hemisphere. It is my footprint and my lifestyle and that of my parents and pretty much just me and my parents' generation that has brought on this catastrophe. As the climate breaks down all around the world, I will be okay. I have caused it, but I won't really suffer. The people who have not caused it are the ones who will suffer, and they are the ones who have the least ability to protect themselves from the nightmare. It is fundamentally unjust, and you read any page of scripture and you will find that God hates injustice, and his heart is always on the side of the vulnerable. Number six, lastly, our mission and our witness. The headlines are truly scary whichever way you turn. Climate breakdown, species loss, plastic pollution, air and soil degradation. Our non-Christian friends, colleagues and families are increasingly scared and some of them feeling desperate and hopeless. We know that we have hope in Christ. We know the power of repentance that leads to transformed living. If we fail to act, our credibility and our mission as Christians is horribly damaged. But if we act, we can form great partnerships with millions of non-Christians all over the world who are passionate to see change. And we can be gospel witnesses as we walk the talk and give the reason for the hope that is within us. So in a nutshell, what we're talking about tonight is non-negotiable. This is not an add-on to our faith or an optional extra. This is our faith. There we go. Brilliant. Ruth, Bishop Ruth, thank you so much for that, for, for grounding us, really, setting out the reasons why Christians should care for God's creation very clearly. But the question always is what real difference can we as individuals make? Well, to help us think that through, we're joined by the Reverend Dr. Dave Bookless, as well as being Director of theology at Arosha International. He leads on working to embed creation care into international Christian organizations and mission movements. One of his books, Planet Wise, Daring to Care for God's World, has been translated into five languages and is used as a basic biblical guide to creation care in all kinds of contexts worldwide. Another, God Doesn't Do Waste, is about his own family's journey into caring for creation, which led to he and his wife co-founding Arosha UK. Dave, welcome this evening. We're so glad to have you with us. I need to just be unmuted. <laughs> there we are, Dave, you're yeah. on. Hello. Say hi now. It's, it's lovely to be with you. And, and thank you so much, Bishop Ruth, for what you just shared as well. So, Dave, I mean, as Bishop Ruth just outlined, the climate emergency we're in is so huge and so urgent that it sometimes feels as if encouraging people to change the way they wash their clothes or to use a bamboo toothbrush is really just tinkering at the edges. So, so maybe you can talk a bit about what impact the changes we make 
in our families, in our households, can have on what feels like an overwhelming global problem? Thank you. I think I think there are several levels to answer that at. One, one is that it's it's less about the impact of what we do, and it's more about as Christians trying to be obedient to what God wants us to do. So if 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 this is a right way of living as disciples of Jesus Christ, then we should do it whether or not it has an impact. Secondly, lots and lots of small impacts really add up. It, it's something I've noticed over the last 15 or 20 years that things that seemed outlandish and crazy and radical uh, a while ago, once more and more people start doing those things, uh, it, they, they catch on, they become infectious. Uh, and the third reason I think is that when we do things, it doesn't just change things elsewhere, it changes us. And sometimes it's those, those really small everyday habits that we're so used to that actually will change us. They'll change our thinking, they'll change our relationship with God and our relationship with our neighbor and our relationship with God's earth. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think there are a whole lot of reasons why even the small things really matter. And, it, and, and we certainly find, don't we, that, that doing one thing leads to another thing, leads to another thing, leads to another thing. There's kind of a chain reaction. A absolutely, and, and that's, that's something really important because when people first, kind of when it dawns on people how big and how sig significant all of this is, people often feel overwhelmed and are almost paralyzed into doing nothing because they think, well, there's so much to do. And what I, what I always say to people is start with one thing. And if you're a Christian, stop and ask the Holy Spirit, where do you want me to start? And it may be something different for different people, but start with that one thing, but don't stop with that one thing. Let it lead on to other things and to, perhaps bigger and bigger changes in your lifestyle. Now in this, what has been a very strange year in so many ways, uh, many people do seem to have got a bit more in touch with nature, don't they? Going for walks, appreciating the natural world a little bit more than before. Does that encourage you? It, it encourages me greatly. And I, I really hope we don't lose that as we move forward from here. Um, during that big first lockdown, there was, there was so much talk uh, about people noticing how things could be. Uh, you know, I live really near the M4 and under the Heathrow flight path and not hearing constant traffic and planes, being able to hear skylarks singing in the fields where I live in London, in urban London. Those are things I don't want to lose. And of course, we do need to go back to certain things, but we need to think differently about a, what a good kind of life is and about what a good kind of society is and that includes our relationship with nature but i suspect we we still take our local green spaces and local wildlife for granted so what changes would you like to see in the way we all relate to to the natural world around us it, our back gardens onwards really i think i can only speak personally on this and and for me it's when my relationship with god became more connected to my relationship with, with nature, with God's creation, um, that it really became transformed. When I started, rather than just sitting indoors with an open Bible in a darkened room um, to have my, my, my time with God, but actually having the Bible on my phone, going out for a walk and chatting to God and finding that God actually speaks indirectly, but just with little nudges, through the wind, through the trees, through the bird song, through so many different things, and actually sensing God's heart for creation, sensing that the Holy Spirit is groaning through the groaning of creation. For me, that that was really, really transformative. And you know, for for some folks, that might sound a little bit too sort of you know almost pagan. Um, but if we read the Psalms, if we read the the scriptures, we find that so often. Uh, it's actually people's worship starts with with creation and creation's already worshipping God. We simply join in uh, and we're better to join in. Mm. Yes, I'm reading a, a fabulous Advent book um, around the poems of R.S. Thomas. Oh, and so many of his poems are exactly that. Seeing God, feeling God in in the light in the fields or the birds, or, you know, amazing. All of those images are there and all those um, 
encouragements are there to do exactly what you're talking about. Um, how, so when you got to the point of, of your faith and your engagement in nature and conservation kind of merging together, um, what did that then do? Uh, what impact did it have on, on your faith? Um, I, when it first happened, I was actually training for ordination. So I was a theological student. And the first thing it made me do was ask lots of hard questions in lectures um, and, and really start yeah. grilling, grilling my lecturers about why aren't we being taught about this? You know, what does this passage actually mean? You know, when it says in John 3.16 that God so loved the cosmos, when you learn New Testament Greek, that word jumps out at you. Um, when we look at, you know, one of the most popular children's stories in the Old Testament, the story of Noah, and realize it's, it's, it's fundamentally about a God who's passionate about biodiversity conservation um, because he wants every living creature to be there on the ark. And in fact, there are far more of them than there are of the humans. There are only four pairs of humans. There are seven pairs of most animals. Um, and it kind of turns upside down some of your presuppositions that aren't biblical, but are more cultural. They've kind of grown up in our Western Christianity. Uh, and and the Bible challenges those if we allow it to. Just lastly, for the moment, um, what difference do you think the creation care scheme could make for us all? I, I think it's it's a fantastic initiative. Um, I'm I'm fairly new to having discovered it. I really like the the different sections that we're going to hear about, the different lifestyle dimensions that we're encouraged to look at. I think it's it's one piece in a jigsaw. I think it fits together well with something like uh, a Russia's eco church scheme, which Helen's going to talk more about. Um, it fits well with commitment to justice and and a passion for the kind of things that Tear Fund is involved in. Um, I think it it fits well with hands on engagement with nature, which is what a Russia is all about. Um, so. I think it, it's one very important piece of a, of a bigger jigsaw. Um, and, uh, and it's been a missing piece for, for many of us to actually have a scheme we could follow uh, in terms of our personal lifestyle. So I, I really welcome it. Great. Dave, for the moment, thank you very much indeed. So I think it's time now to find out how the creation care scheme works from the person responsible for it. Annabelle South leads the St Paul's Action on Climate and the Environment at St Paul's Church in Dorking. Her day job is in health research communication, working with partners in Africa and the UK on diseases such as HIV, TB, cancer, and more recently, COVID-19. She's also a wildlife enthusiast and, wait for it, licensed dormouse surveyor, which I love. One day, I hope she'll allow me to go out with her and find some dormice. So Annabelle, we are so excited to hear all about creation care and how to put it into practice. So I'll leave that one to you. Thank you, Hannah. And thank you everyone. I'm so excited that you're all here tonight to, uh, to hear about this. Um, so as Christians, and as Ruth talked about, we know the earth is the Lord's and it is good. We also know that his creation is in trouble because of the damage caused by humans and that our neighbours around the world are suffering because of this. So we know we must act. At St Paul's Church Dorking, we spent the last few years trying to improve how we as a church care for God's creation. We were delighted to receive our Silver Eco Church Award in October 2018 but we were aware that we could have a much greater impact if we could really engage the people who make up our church with caring for creation. I think many Christians are recognizing the need for action in their own lives, but this covers so many different things. It can be hard to know how to start or what to prioritize. Over the last 18 months, we have developed a scheme aimed at church households to help them look at seven areas of their life to see where they're doing well and give ideas for action to care for God's creation. The areas are worship and prayer, a home, garden, travel, food, possessions, and community and global engagement. The creation care scheme is designed to help households systematically look at these areas to see where they're doing well and give ideas for how they can better care for God's creation. We decided to focus on households rather than individuals as many of the decisions that we make that affect the environment, such as where we get our electricity from or how high our thermostat is set to or what we eat, are often made at the household rather than individual level. 
Hopefully by working through the creation care scheme together with the people we live with, we can discuss these decisions, the values of it inform them and why we care. And these conversations are important. In fact, Catherine Hayhoe, who is a, a leading climate scientist and a Christian, um, says that talking about climate change with those we love is one of the most important things we can do. So hopefully the scheme will help start those discussions. The creation care scheme is designed to help households work out what their next steps are in caring for God's creation, whether they're completely new to this or have been trying to live sustainably for years. So this means we've tried to set bronze at an achievable level for, for many people, while also making gold really ambitious to help households who already do a lot identify where they could further improve. So don't be discouraged if you're not already at the award level you'd like to be when you, when you join the scheme. The Anglican Baptism Liturgy describes the church as Christ's pilgrim people. As a fan of Plymouth Argyle Football Club, who are also known as the Pilgrims, I've always enjoyed that description. And I think it's really appropriate here. When we give our lives to Jesus, we don't instantly become perfect, but we begin on a journey starting from wherever we happen to be to become more like Christ. Rather than be daunted at how far we have to go, we should instead get on with taking this next step and then the next. So if you feel overwhelmed by the scale of the challenge of responding to climate breakdown and other environmental problems, use the creation care scheme to help you identify which areas you need to work on first and focus on taking that first step and then the one after and so on as we press on towards the goal. We don't want this to be a one-off thing where people complete the questions, get a certificate and then never think about it again. We want people to keep engaging with it, making changes and working their way up through the awards levels. Um, as has already been, been mentioned, the Creation Care Scheme is inspired by EcoChurch. So those of you who, who've already been involved in that will recognise similarities. It's built around a questionnaire and households can achieve bronze, silver and gold awards. So um, I think it's about time I showed you the, the website so you can see what we're talking about. Hopefully, uh, hopefully now you can see, see the website. Um, so to get started on the scheme, go to creationcare.org.uk and then click on the households link in the menu at the top. So there you can register an account with an email address and a password You'll, and click submit. You'll then get sent an email with a link to verify your account. If you don't see an email within a few minutes, just check your junk mail folder. You can also sign up to receive monthly email newsletters with ideas, tips and resources using this form here. So once you've verified your account and, and logged into it, you will be taken to, to this page, which is just coming up now with my internet speed. Here we go. So enter a, a, a household name for your household. And also fill in how many people live in your household. And this is important for some of the calculations that happen behind the scenes of, of the, uh, the scheme. If your church has uh, registered for the scheme, signed up to it as a church, then you can enter, you can link your account to that using that box there. But don't worry if it hasn't, um, you can just leave that box blank. Once you've done that, click save. And then you can go and have a look at the dashboard, which gives you an overview of how you're doing in the different areas. So you can see that the seven areas that I spoke about uh, each have their own box. So pick one of the seven areas, click on update answers, and then you'll get taken through to the questions for that, that area. So most of these questions are drop down questions. So work your way through it, picking the, the the right answer for you or the closest one to, to your household situation. You'll see at the bottom as you complete the questions your score goes up and you can also see what award level you're at in that area. So when you've finished that click save and it will take you back to the dashboard. To get to bronze you need to score a quarter of the available points in that area, half for silver and three quarters for gold. So there are more than 120 questions in total in this scheme. So you might like to work on it over several sessions rather than try and do it all in one go. Simply log back in next time you want to work on it and pick up where you left off. Um, if you don't have a garden, don't worry. The first question you get asked in that se section is, do you have a garden? And if you don't, you don't have to answer any other questions. Once you've completed all seven areas, you'll be able to see whether you've reached an overall award level here at the bottom. So at the moment, because we haven't filled in all the other sections, we've got none. Uh, but 
to, to get to a bronze level overall, you need to have achieved bronze level in each of the seven areas or six if you don't have a garden. For silver, you need to get to silver in each, at least silver in each of the areas and to get to gold, you need to get to gold in all the areas, which means that you may well have some areas where you're where you're not at the level that you want to be at. So perhaps that's a good place to start, looking back through those areas where, where you're, you're not scoring so well and see, seeing what, ch what changes you'd need to make to reach the level you'd want to, to get to. And you can do this if you have a look at, at how, the, how the points change and how your awards change, if you pick different level, different answers in the questions, you can see what changes you might need to make to reach that. So once you've, once you've achieved an award level, um, you, can, you can access your certificate. A box will appear here where you can click on the link and then you'll be taken to, to your certificate in your browser. And you can use your browser options to save that certificate or print it off. If your account is linked to a church that is registered for the scheme, when you achieve an award, your church's nominated contact person will receive an email telling them that, the household name here that you've entered here have achieved bronze or silver or gold awards and if your church is choosing to give out certificates during services or or in some other way then they can give you out those certificates then so other things to point out about the website there's a resources page which has some useful links to things which i've come across which have helped me in my creation care journey um, and that's something which hopefully will be expanding and, and growing is people suggest more things that we can put on there. So that's worth looking at. The about the website page can, contains information about how it all works. And then the frequently asked questions is where we put some answers to some of the questions we get asked most frequently. Um, and that will be expanding as we get asked more questions. So do keep an eye on that if you do have any questions. As you can probably imagine, a scheme like this doesn't happen overnight. And there are some key people I need to thank. Firstly, everyone at St Paul's Church Dorking who is involved in developing, piloting the scheme, supporting its creation, um, and particularly obviously Ruth and uh, my husband, Chris, who has been a sounding board, tester, encourager, and Excel advisor. Um, and the, the person who, who made the generous donation that made this website possible, I've got to thank a lot as well. Grant and Paul at Design Links for turning that Excel file with complex formulae into a user friendly website. Um, and Guildford Diocese Environment Group who've supported and encouraged the development of the scheme. Um, Helen and Andy at Our Rosha have given some really wise advice. Uh, and to, I'd like to thank everyone who's helped promote the scheme uh, and particularly Tear Fund uh, uh, for, for their support. And then obviously Hannah, Ruth, Dave and Helen for their contributions this evening and everybody for joining. I'm so excited to finally be able to share this with you all. So thank you. Um, so that's all for me and I shall hand back over to Hannah if I can find the right button to press to unmute her. Great. Annabelle, that, that is great. I'm so excited about this for us all. And it certainly inspired me to get going with it in our church family as soon as we can. Um, just take this moment before we talk to Helen, before we hear from Helen, to encourage you to post questions to the panel, uh, if you have any. And the way to do that, let me just remind you, is to go to www.sly.do, S-L-I dot D-O. And then there's a slash I don't know if that's important or not but anyway have a go at that and if you enter creation care into the box that will take you to the point um, the place where you can post the questions so if you have any please do that while I'm talking to Helen or rather when she while she's talking to us so um, as an eco church um, where I go to church I'm really wondering how the two schemes mix together eco church and creation care and how they can work together. And fortunately with us is exactly the right person to answer that question. Helen Stevens is church relations manager at Arosha UK and leads the Eco Church Scheme. There couldn't be a more perfect person to talk to us at this point. So Helen, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Hannah. Um, it's a real privilege to join you this evening for this event which as much as being a launch, feels like it should also be a point to pause and celebrate um, what, as Annabelle has um, alluded to, is undoubtedly 12 to 18 months of hard work by her 
and the team at St Paul's in Dorking. And what has been achieved is remarkable. We've seen an interesting shift during almost five years of running Eco Church from churches struggling more with how to incorporate caring for creation into their worship and teaching and struggling with saving energy in their buildings to lifestyle as being the category which most often presents challenges. Unsustainable choices and patterns of consumption um, seem to be hardwired into our culture and society. And it can be hard to know where to start and how to make the continual improvements that we know are needed if collectively we want to influence a simpler, more sustainable way of life for all. There are obvious synergies with Eco Church, and uh, we're really encouraged that Eco Church has inspired this incredible work to develop something um, for Christians in our homes. And it will certainly help churches in tackling the lifestyle category of Eco Church alongside Arosha's own more informal wild Christian scheme. And the lifestyle category, um, I think, as, as Dave mentioned, perhaps has struggled a bit and perhaps has been hard to tackle because there hasn't been a tool like this. And whilst we ask churches to go out and encourage, um, encourage us in our homes to take these actions, um, th this framework will be really helpful. So we're hugely supportive of Creation Care. Though to be clear, um, we can take none of the credit. It's an entirely independent initiative. We're very open though to sharing lessons that we're learning from five years of running Eco Church, and we'll um, hopefully work closely with Annabelle and follow um, the progress. And once the sort of initial um, bedding period is over um, and whatever teething issues have been ironed out and really hope that there aren't many or any, um, we're going to be very happy to include it and point to it as an additional resource for the lifestyle section of Eco Church. And just thinking, why is it that churches struggle with this section? Maybe because it's the most personal. Each of our circumstances is different, and some of the choices are financial ones, such as purchasing local or organic food, which is why I think it's beholden on all of us in our churches to campaign for fairness, for example, in a shift towards access to healthier food for, for all. I was really struck by a news item last week about two vicars in Burnley who'd been feeding local families, those who have fallen through the cracks of any more formal support. And it left me thinking, how does sustainability or indeed lifestyle considerations fit in communities where churches are helping people just to get by and have some food, let alone locally grown, fair trade and organic. Um, I was reading actually just earlier today about a church in Liverpool that's using its community garden to grow herbs and vegetables, which are then being taken um, to a local food bank to, uh, to give people a chance to eat fresh and locally grown produce. Well, this is perhaps one for a longer conversation than we have time for now. But I think it does have a lot of relevance, not least in us playing our part in tackling some of the systemic issues in our society, which we might do, for example, through the global and community engagement um, part of Eco Church. But these are issues that we can influence through our own lifestyle choices and behaviours, like choosing to bank ethically. So I think this creation care initiative will be a tremendous asset to many of us in our daily lives providing a framework as EcoChurch does for helping us to make and measure our progress. Congratulations on launching such a comprehensive programme for Christians in our homes. And we at Arosha will give you all the support that we can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, right, we're going to turn to questions now. Uh, I think those who need to be unmuted are unmuted. Or Ruth isn't. There she is. Excellent. Thank you for posting uh, your questions. Just before we start, there was a question uh, about, maybe you can just answer this quickly, Annabelle, about how people can watch this back afterwards. Unfortunately, it was posted earlier and I should have asked you earlier about, um, about whether people will need to make notes. So it's a little late for that. <laughs> they can watch it. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> so scribbles will, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, we are recording this and we will put this up on the, the Creation Care YouTube channel and also on our Facebook page, which is Creation Care UK. So all those links um, will be available at the end of the webinar. So, uh, yeah, you can stop writing notes now. Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't ask that one earlier. Um, so the kind of questions people are coming up with, let's start with this, which has had quite a lot of um, agreement as something uh, that people want to know. Scientifically speaking, what are the most impactful things I should do? Who wants to take that one? Maybe Dave? Yes, it's, it's, it's possible that others will be, uh, be more expert on this than me, but, but in terms of categories, I, I always say the four big areas that we can tackle are food, travel, energy use, and what we buy. Uh, uh, and those, those are the four big areas. And, and it will depend on your circumstances, which you can do first. If you're, if you're somebody who flies around the world when we're allowed to taking lots of foreign holidays, then that may be the biggest thing that will make a difference in your life. If you're somebody that eats lots of meat, particularly beef, then changing that may be the biggest thing that you can do in your life. If you have your heating on very high and your house isn't well insulated, it may be energy is the biggest change you can make in law, your life. So it does depend on your circumstances to an extent. Does anyone else want to add to that? No, should we, should we move on then? Um, I, I would just add, um, taking a really sober look at our, con our basic consumption, um, and this uh, insatiable habit of just going out and buying new because we can afford to and it's one click on Amazon is all it takes now. It's a blink just to, just to get anything we want delivered tomorrow new and totally examining that impulse because it's, it's an impulse of about the last five years and suddenly it's just too easy um and really radically overhauling our our insatiable appetite to consume and wearing and wearing and wearing clothes <laughs> and using and using you know implements until they need repairing <laughs> and um uh, every 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 time we we go to consume just having a little pause and asking ourselves, do I really need this? Can I borrow it from a friend? Can I get it secondhand? Or can I just go without it actually? And I think that um, that's quite a profound mind, mind shift. And Annabelle, actually I'll bring you in here because at St Paul's, uh, you've got a, a very simple, straightforward scheme going, which helps people do that. Yeah, so this, this was Ruth's idea in the first place, um, but we've created a WhatsApp group called Simple Sharing. And if somebody needs something, so for example, uh, back in the days when you could go on holiday, um, <laughs> then Chris and I were, were going on holiday, so girls are silly, and we needed a suitcase. And it'd be really easy to go out and buy a new one, but then we would use it for how many weeks a year? And I know there's somebody else at Simple's who'll have a suitcase. So um, putting out a message and then somebody says, oh, yes, you can borrow mine. We don't need to. We don't need to have a church full of people with hedge trimmers, um, which get used how often. Uh, and it, Ruth's right. It is such a we've been drilled into thinking uh, that, that we should just buy stuff because we can and because it, we have more security more security if we own everything ourselves but I think there's something about the early church holding everything in common it's really biblical to do this as well as saving the planet and so um, our whatsapp group takes very little maintenance and we must have saved tons of stuff being bought because people have been generous giving stuff and lending stuff and stopping stuff go to waste so that has been such a win an easy win and um, hopefully that's that's kind of helping to change change my mindset um, about what my first instinct is when I need something. No, oh, that's brilliant. Um, there's a question here that I think is is I, I hear this from a lot of people. How do I get my church more involved if they're not very into the green agenda? Where do you start when you when you feel that people just aren't interested or don't think that it's even despite what you said, Ruth, you know, don't think it's part of the kind of central 
mission of the church of what we're there to do and a kind of distraction almost how do you how do you start that how do you how do you get people engaged how do you help them engage yeah I would say don't be too ambitious to begin with you're looking for a couple of other like-minded people to get a little bit of a critical mass and for a while you might be the prophet in the wilderness on the edge going on about this so my first tip is to pray start praying very specifically for God to set other people's hearts on fire for this in your church and to show you who they are and then when you've got just a group of three of you and you meet to pray at that point go to the church leadership um, because if you go as a lone voice it's not necessarily the best time uh, because if the vicar was really into this he or she would be doing this in your church so if it's not happening in your church the vicar's going to take some persuading they're going to be more persuaded by a small group of people than by one person um, I would then say get your message out every church parish magazine editor is always short for content so start writing your articles posting stuff to the church Facebook um, ask if you can model well, model some of this when you get yourself on the intercession rotor and just start every time you pray out loud at church bringing up stuff about the environment um, in your liturgy ask the vicar can you just have one Sunday a year instead of just doing that harvest festival thing we plow the fields and scatter well actually most of us don't really anymore uh, can we have that Sunday and do a creation care theme and get the kids involved if the kids want to get a bronze award the parent if they bug their parents you know because they've been doing this in their kids clubs the parents will get on board see if you can get it out through the the youth and children's work because that generation are absolutely um with you on this um that's a given and then finally i'd say you know talk to your pcc or get on your pcc get yourself elected and get into the systems of governance. If you're an Anglican, that will be Deanery Synod or Diocesan Synod. So you can be that prophet asking those awkward questions and driving change uh, by getting the, this stuff on the agenda. Um, and lastly, I'd say, you know, culture change. Uh, it, it, it does get driven by a, usually a small number of passionate people. So if you're small in number, uh, don't, be, don't be discouraged. Um, it will make a difference. I, Annabelle uh, is a great story because she was quite a lone voice many, many, many years ago. And it, it was quite a desert place, I hope you don't mind me saying, Annabelle, for quite a while. Uh, and actually that piece of formation and that piece of work that God does in your prayer life through this, as you persevere and persevere, uh, it is valuable. So don't give up. Mm. It's hard though, isn't it? Somebody's posted a question here that is very familiar, I imagine, to all of us, that actually sometimes, this person said, sometimes I just feel hopeless about it all and depressed about how few people are willing to change. So how do we keep our own enthusiasm and energy high when we feel overwhelmed, not just by the, the global situation, but about the fact that we are that, perhaps that lone voice crying in the wilderness? Um, shall I jump in on that one? Go for it, Dave. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and by the way, thank you, Ruth, for what you said to that previous one. I thought that those were excellent answers. I think the only thing I'd add is um, if you've got a, a church leader, a vicar or, or whatever, who's who's not on board, challenge them. Give them a short book on the subject to read. Could be planet wise, could be something else. Um, and say to them, if I give you six months time, um, because it may be just that they haven't had time to sit down and think it through biblically and to, to work out why they should be doing this. So, so that was on that. And then on the, the sort of feeling alone on this, I think join an organisation where there are others. And uh, I mean, Arosha is a great example um, where you can get together with other Christians who are similarly passionate. And if there aren't many in your church, it may be you need to be fed elsewhere in this area. Um, but it also try and find two or three people locally and, and look beyond your church friends. 
as well. Find others who are involved in local wildlife charities, local environmental groups, and say, look, I'm trying to get my church on board with this. Um, would you be, be willing to help me and encourage me? Uh, and, and actually, sometimes those relationships can work in all kinds of ways, and, and people can stumble their way without realizing it into getting involved in faith um, by, by getting involved in something like this. So, so those, are, those are things I would say. The final thing I'd say is I, I find nature is the great healer here. It, it's, it's spending time with God in creation that raises my hopes. If I've had a bad day, if things are, are really discouraging me, I, I go out for a walk uh, and let, let God speak to me through creation. So that, that's how I get through it. Can I just add one thing, actually? Um, talk to other churches locally who are doing this. Um, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago that we'd been wanting to do for ages of local eco churches. And there were seven of us on this Zoom meeting. And it was wonderful, the kind of energy that came from that and the kind of mutual appreciation uh, of being encouraged by each other and being kind of um, held in what we were doing by each other. And I'm hoping that that will, you know, help build those relationships so that we do all feel like we're you know, in this together. Um, and that in itself is incredibly kind of encouraging and, and, and building up um, both in the kind of things we're doing, but also in our faith journeys as well. Um, uh, sorry, Helen, yes. Okay. I was, I was just gonna add about being creative and I think just to build on what Dave was saying about almost going back to nature. Um, I think more churches have been exploring worshipping outdoors, especially during this year and this time of pandemic. And it's perhaps finding those times together when we can be in nature, um, you know, setting up a group just to go for a walk and stop every now and again and maybe read a poem, some of R.S. Thomas's verses or whatever it might be, and have that shared experience. You know, mo most of us, if we stop to think, we'll find something in nature that we absolutely love. I was on a call yesterday with people sharing about their favourite animals. And the stories that come from that are just really inspiring and they help us to get to know each other better as well. Thank you. Um, I'd say, can I just throw in that it's a, it's a fascinating question. That I'd want us to also allow room for lament mm. um, because Christian spirituality is not all enthusiasm and activity and excitement and energy you know there's a great great power in lament and when we feel overwhelmed and and sort of broken by the news and what we see around us and apathy and and our own sin our own complicit you know uh to go to that place of lament either on your own or with others is a is a right it is a right response to what we're living through uh, and we mustn't just dismiss and deny um, but uh, encounter God in our sorrow and in our anger uh, and as we look at injustice and you know we have such a rich spirituality um, to engage with here um, and out of that beautiful things are born um, so I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be shy of pressing into those feelings of despair and loss and grief because they're appropriate. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Um, somebody said here that some things that a household might feel they need to do to mitigate climate change are very expensive. So is there a chance in all this that an award system like this risks disempowering households that, that don't have as much, poorer households? So that's, so that's a really important question, I think. And there are some things like Helen mentioned, local organic food is more expensive than, than what you can, can get from a supermarket that's been flown in from wherever. But um, so, so there are some things which are expensive. There are some things which just won't be possible for everybody. Um, but on the other hand, uh, so St Paul's there is quite is in Dorking, which is in Surrey, which is quite an affluent area. And I think where we struggled, the, the areas we struggled when we were piloting this 
um, we're in some of the, the areas where, where rich people struggle. Um, so lots of people travel to go on holiday to expensive places. And um, obviously that's got huge consequences to the climate. And, and so, and also buying stuff rather than, you know, buying, buying new clothes rather than secondhand clothes or these sorts of things. These, there are temptations which, um, which the affluent face, which makes it hard for, for them to live sustainably. And we've seen in the news this week, actually it's the richest 10% of the global population who are, who are doing 50% of the, causing 50% of the emissions. Um, so I think, I think there, is, there are things which everybody will struggle with, whatever background they're coming from. And, and maybe some, some of the actions are not options for everyone. So we have to bear that in mind. Um, I think the, the way I look at these uh, is, is a tool to help you see what's, what you can do, what's feasible for you. And if you're never going to get gold, don't beat yourself up about that. It's helping you identify what your next step is and knowing that you're doing that as part of your discipleship. It shouldn't be, I mean, the awards are nice to have. We all like a pat on the back and well done, you're doing well. But it should be a tool to help help everybody work out what what can I do next what's feasible for me um, th there's lots of questions thank you so much for them and we're not going to get to them all and I'm sorry about that um, can I say on that one that last question yes do um here's my silver award <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the reasons we can't get gold is because we live in tired accommodation I can't put solar panels on my roof because I don't own the property I live in and I never will. Uh, uh, so, you know, they're, they're, everyone has their constraints. Mm -hmm. And I just would like to underline what Annabelle is saying that you might be in rental accommodation, you might be in a bed sit, you might be a student in student accommodation uh, where your food is provided by halls of residence. Every, you know, people's circumstances are so, so different. Um, but I think what it does do is it helps you break down the areas of life that are common to all of us and just helps you think more clearly. Uh, and there's one huge, there are several huge areas that are, that are really uh, free of charge. One is around our worship and our engagement with God and bringing this, this into our spirituality. And the other is an interesting one, which is in the whole field of campaigning and um, contacting your MP or um, contacting you know the council about divesting from fossil fuel uh, and all that kind of thing and these days the cost of a an email for most people is you know is something most people have a mobile you know uh, so there are fields which really are free of charge as well as I think it's a really good question because um, uh, yeah not everybody can can buy an electric car yeah mm -hmm. I think we're going to leave it there. Um, we've got through some of the questions. I'm very sorry that we haven't managed to get to all of them. Thank you so much uh, for posting them. Um, but there are ways of continuing this conversation and perhaps Annabelle can put up the slide which will help us do that. Um, while she's doing that, I just want to thank our guests this evening, Bishop Ruth, Dave Bookless, Helen Stevens, and of course, thank you so much to Annabelle South for creating the Creation Care Scheme and talking us through it this evening. And of course, the main thing that we hope will come out of this is that you are thoroughly inspired to sign up for Creation Care as individuals and in your churches. So coming up in a moment, uh, here it is, is uh, the web address that tells you exactly how you can join up. Uh, all the instructions are there to sign up to the scheme and to sign up for those monthly emails that Annabelle was talking about. And if we want to continue this conversation, you can follow Creation Care on Facebook and Twitter too. Um, there are the ways of doing that. So any questions that you didn't get answered this evening, perhaps you can post them there. Perhaps others can then, uh, as opposed to just our marvellous guests this evening, but you know, others may have answers, may have ideas, may have uh, things that they can share, that you can share about the way that you're doing this in your life and in your churches. Uh, so do join in. That's the main point of this evening is to really get the ball rolling on this and really excited to see where it's going to take us all. So thank you so much for being here and good night.